Thank you guys for being here. My name is Sarah Walker. I'm the Director of Student Services. Um, and I am beyond thrilled to have Mary Scott Williams from the Junior High and Debbie Raisler from NORD, um, who are two of our guidance counselors here to talk on this subject. This is a very hot button topic, I think, that we see in the schools with the kids. We hear about from you guys. And so I think the more we can learn about it and the more we can all be a team in helping our kids navigate all of the ins and outs, um, of bullying and meanness, I think, is, is just going to be better off for everybody in the long run. So, thank you for being here. And I'm. Did you break my paper? No, no. I hope not. We'll yes. find out. We'll um, hi, everyone. My name is Mary Scott Williams. I am a school counselor at the junior high. Um, this year, I cover grades sixth grade and eighth, so I rotate with the kids if you've seen me. So, it's kind of nice by the time they're in eighth grade, I've had them three plus years. A um, little background, I um, actually have been in this district since I started my career. I did four years in special education as a special ed teacher, and then this is my fifth year as a school counselor within the district. Um, so I, I've been here a total of nine. You said five already? Yes. Wow. That's crazy. I'm Debbie Riesler. I am new to Nordville School this year. I am in my 17th year in education. I worked in 16 for 16 years in Chapel Chapel Lake City Schools, and I worked with pre-K to six. So I traveled between three buildings. So coming to Nord and being in one building with fourth and fifth grade was a dream come true. So I'm really happy to be here. Um, I also have an 18 year old son who graduated from, from Marinelle Steel. So I'm a proud alum. <coughs> All right, so today we are talking about a topic I would definitely feel that um, Debbie and I are very passionate about. It's a daily conversation we're having with students. Um, so this is kind of our goal for today, our um, overview of our agenda. So we definitely want to go over peer conflict. What is bullying versus what is meanness, because there is a difference. Um, we also want to gain more understanding of the frequency that bullying takes place, as well as meanness takes place. Um, by the end of this, towards the end, we want to go over some step-by-step -step directions. Um, we actually have even a handout to give everybody that you can actually take home, put on your fridge, that when your child comes home and they're hysterical or something's happened, that there's like step-by-step -step directions and even sayings that you can respond to your child to help facilitate those conversations. Um, and then we are going to do some parent scenarios and get your involvement, because everyone loves that, right? Yes. Um, but the overall goal is to really learn the difference between bullying and meanness, um, learn ways parents can help empower your children to become independent problem solvers. I think that is um, definitely a goal. I know Debbie and I have talked about that when we are working with students, it's truly helping them um, gain a better understanding to advocate for themselves, to problem solve for themselves. And I think that's the ultimate goal. Um, and I know it's hard as a parent. We're both parents. I also have three little ones. I have a four-year-old, a two-year-old, and a 10-month-old. Um, so they're not as old. I haven't been through the junior high adolescent ages. But watching even my four-year-old struggle, it, it's hard to watch. Um, so we are going to talk about those things today and hopefully cover our goal, all right? All right, so just to kind of kick it off, bullying versus meanness. So we definitely view that meanness and bullying all fall under um, just pure conflict. So if we have just a huge umbrella called pure conflict, we could definitely insert bullying and meanness under there. And there's definitely two different, there are two different words that mean two different things. Um, Overall, we look at it as students having an intolerance for someone being unkind. They don't know what is an appropriate reaction to someone being unkind. Um, I think we find that 80% of peer conflict um, that we truly try to help students solve are meanness. It's not bullying. Um, so yes, we are going to go over bullying. It is a hot button word. Um, but just in my five years as a school counselor, um, I know Debbie's been in education 16. I think we can both say majority of the situations we work with are truly just pure conflict under the title of meanness. Kids being mean to one another, not being kind, would not qualify under the title of bullying. Um, so we want to differentiate those two today because there is a clear difference between them. All right, so by state law. So this is just state law of what is bullying. Um, and it is an intentional, written, verbal, or physical act, including but not limited to to one shown to be motivated by any characteristics such as race, color, religion, ancestry, national origin, gender, sexuality orientation, um, sexual orientation, mental or physical disability, or other distinguishing characteristics 
when the intentional act includes. So when we're looking at a situation, if a kid's come to us, and I, if I'm trying to determine if it's bullying, if it's meanness, I go over these three things. I look at it as like a triangle. Um, in order for it to be bullying, it truly has to be um, intentional. Sorry, intentional, <laughs> right? So it has to be intentional. There has to be a purpose behind it. They had to have done it on purpose to hurt somebody, to cause some type of harm. Um, there has to also be, that's where the student's education, oh, okay, so this is the overview. Physical <coughs> um, sorry, I kind of jumped ahead. So when I'm looking at bullying, I'm looking at it has to be intentional, it has to be repeated, um, and it has to um, be a targeted act. So this is the state law defined by, which is this the state law defined by bullying? Um, when it's a physical harm to a student or damages his or her property, substantially interferes with the student's education, is so severe, persistent, or persuasive that it creates an intimidating or threatening environment um, that disrupts the orderly operation of school. That's a pretty, this last one is super, that's a big statement. Like, it's, in, it's, it's impacting their, their daily living. It's intimidating, it's threatening. They're in a threatening environment. So when we're unpacking things and talking with students, we have to look at this one. That's a really, really, really big one. And we're going to dive into it deeper. I guess we wanted to give an overview. That's why it kind of takes me back because I don't really refer to the state law every time I'm talking to a kid. Um, it's more I'm looking at the outline of our handbook. So like this is even our handbook. It breaks it down. Um, that truly what bullying is, it's intentional. Um, it's directed towards another student. as Another student's being targeted. And it's a repeated in action. Um, so you would agree that the majority of the students that you're talking to, it's not really qualified for this. But, I mean, it does happen. And so today we're also going to talk about how to unravel those situations and how to help students feel empowered. So my three triangles that I was talking about was, if we're determining if a situation with your child, another child is bullying, it has to be intentional. So the child has to intentionally wanting to harm or hurt your child or, or your child intentionally harming somebody else. Um, it has to be repetitive, which means it's had to have happened more than once. So if your baby comes home and says, well, this kid called me a name, okay, well, has it happened before? No, this is the first time, so it's not bullying. Okay, so it has to be a repetitive act. Um, and then my third thing is there has to be a power imbalance. Um, and we're going to talk about that a little bit in depth because it does get to be a little difficult, like what qualifies a power imbalance. Um, but those are my three triangles when we talk about bullying that I want us to look at. It has to be targeted, there has to be a power imbalance, and it has to be repetitive. If it's not all three, we are just labeling as meanness. Um, and when I kind of backed up to our beginning slides, you know, 80% of peer conflict we are experiencing when the students talk to us, we have those conversations, we witness it, 80% is just truly, and unfortunately, kids being mean to one another. So it is important to have that knowledge when you're trying to help your child work through different situations. So five types of bullying. Um, I think that you guys are probably really familiar with all of these. Verbal, I would say that's the one that we see most at school, it, relating to like gossiping, ignoring, isolation, spreading rumors, teasing. In fourth and fifth grade, I see that the most, I would say. Um, so, and like um, Mrs. Williams just said, so is it happening all the time? Did it happen just once? Was it on the bus? And we're gonna talk about that. Physical would be the pushing, shoving, kicking, hitting. Um, you know, I, I feel like, not to be stereotypical, I see a lot of that mostly with boys. And, and we're gonna talk about like what's goofing around and being silly and playing around, you know, and non-intentional that turns into somebody getting hurt. You know, that, that I, we, we talk about that a lot in our offices, I think. Um, and then sexual, you know, touching, grabbing, motioning, and then property, I don't, I, we don't, I don't see this much in, in my building, property, hiding belongings maybe. Um, and then the cyberbullying is, is a big one also, starting, I would say, as early as third and fourth grade. Um, students sending pictures, emails, text messages that are negative, mean, degrading, unwanted, or without somebody's permission. So those are, those are the biggest ones. I, I focus, when we're talking a lot about peer conflict and, and meanness, a lot of it is related to one and two. That's what we see most. So, um, oh, sorry about that. Bullying is, we talked about this, is not an isolated incident. So we, we're looking at, is, was it on purpose or was it an accident? So, you know, when a student comes to me and they say, you know, I got shoved into the locker, 
you know, we have to kind of like dive into that. What does that mean? How many, what else was happening in the hallway? How many people were in the hallway? Was it an accident? What was the person's facial features? Were they laughing? Were they, you know, you know, you, and then you fell down. Were they laughing when, they, when, you, when, when that happened? That would describe whether it's accidental or intentional. So we're just trying to gather all the facts. You know, was it an accident? We don't know. Power imbalance would mean, you know, somebody that has, is older than you, somebody that, you know, is stronger than you, somebody that is maybe, try to give another example of that. I don't know, this is where it gets kind of just difficult to dissect what would be a power imbalance, but even sometimes social circles could be different. When I got a group of kids, um, they're all friends, say there's five of them, and I got one kid hanging by themselves. I could see that being a power imbalance. Can, can, does that kind of make sense to everybody? That there's obviously an imbalance of power that somebody is by themselves. I also look at it as like they're unable to defend themselves, unable to respond. Um, so like this week I dealt with a student who's more of an introvert, He's quiet, and he, he, he truly struggles to defend himself. He struggles to voice that or do anything about it. I would consider that a power imbalance, where that when I'm having a situation, it's repetitive, it's intentional, they're trying to harm, this child can't protect themselves or defend, <coughs> stick up for themselves, right. that would know, they don't have the communication too. skills to stick up for themselves. And then the repeated, the repeated is, is, is the biggest one. I get students that come to my office all the time and they say, you know, this student's bullying me on the bus and it's to tell me what happened. And they'll say, well, they called me a mean name today. And, and so we have to kind of re-educate and talk about one mean name is unkind. It's not, it's not kind, but it's not bullying. You know, and then we go through the whole definition of bullying's repeated. You know, well, how did you handle it? Most of them say, I told them that that wasn't nice. I, I ignored it. I told them that that hurt my feelings. Then they were able to, you know, express how they felt and they were able to up for themselves. So when we're looking at, is it normal peer conflict and ju or just being mean behavior or is it bullying? We also have, we have to look at number one, is there equal power? So the majority of this, the situations that come into my office are uh, me and my friend got into a huge fight and now she's spreading rumors or she's talking behind my back and we were friends at one time but now we're not. So they're, they're, we're on an equal playing field. There, there's not a power imbalance there. Um, so no peer conflict is going to happen. You know, when you're when you have friends, I'm an adult. I still have conflict with my friends, um, and it just happens. But when it's bullying, it's happening over and over and over again with the same person. So you know, one person's not getting targeted today, and then a different person tomorrow. So it's the same person, same victim, same act over and over again. And then accidental versus intentional. I think a lot with the some of the physical acts, it's hard to, we have to kind of really like digest and look, is this on purpose or was this on accident? You know, and what goes into that is the interpretation of that person's perspective versus another person's perspective. And that's where it gets really, really tricky because, you know, students in fourth and fifth grade, and I'm sure in sixth and seventh and eighth grade, they see it only from their perspective. You know, when there's another side of the story from that other person's perspective. You know, they're saying, well, I got pushed into the locker and that person fell down and then, then everybody was laughing. And then the other person's perspective is, we were, there were so many kids in the hallway and we were kind of rushing through and that student fell down and everybody was laughing, but it wasn't on purpose. There's a different side of the story. And I think that's frequent, especially at the junior high. I mean, sixth, seventh, and eighth, I'd say weekly, I have, this kid's calling me a name. Okay, like I, you know, he's calling me gay. He's not being nice. Really? Okay, so let's look into that. So the more I dissect it, the more I've talked to both sides, I usually bring them all together. Well, I thought we were joking. You laughed when I said that. You thought, you know what I mean, you kind of responded like you thought, you know, we were on the same page. You laughed when I said it. Well, I laughed because I just was trying to play it cool, right? So complete two different sides. Or I was sides. uncomfortable. Or I was uncomfortable mm -hmm. and didn't know what to do in that scenario, right? So as soon as we open those lines of communication, because there is always three sides, right? What that person says, what that person said, what actually happened, right? So once we open those lines of communication and everyone's on the same page with, wow, I really didn't mean to hurt your feelings, that's usually how those types of scenarios unfold. I mean, I'll be honest with you, most of the meanness when, that comes up to my door, we can usually solve it because it's usually accidental. It's usually not an intentional act of kids trying to be mean. I think they're just so caught up. Like, even if we just think at this age, um, especially in middle school, 
So they're just worried about themselves, right? They're just so focused on what they're doing for the day, what if people are looking at them. They're not worried about how it could be impacting others. So I noticed that's a lot of my conversations is, right, building that empathy to trying to see what it's like from somebody else's side that when you make that comment, it's not okay, but you also need to put yourself in their shoes. So yes, I would say accident intentional is usually, I mean, it's just a big part of your pure conflict. And then serious versus, um, like, Physical or emotional harm versus not serious harm. So in a normal peer, you know, peer conflict, there's not serious harm being done there. And then in bullying, you know, you might end up with a student or somebody that has some, you know, physical marks or like some emotional scars. Like they were, you know, this this could be a traumatic experience for them. They might end up with some anxiety or they need to see somebody. That's a pretty significant um, difference between. You know, I just needed to kind of talk to you about, it hurt my feelings, but I'm able to move on and I'm okay. Um, and then the emotional reaction too, that kind of goes along with what I was just saying. So in pure conflict, you know, my, my feelings are really, really hurt. And for any, you know, fourth through eighth grader, when you're fighting with your friend, you know, it's, it does feel like the end of the world, like nobody likes me, it feels, it, it feels big. But usually in a couple of days after things have settled, we can move on and, you know, that's an appropriate reaction. Whereas over here, the, un the unequal reaction would be the victim is struggling and the, the aggressor is still at it and doing what they're doing and being mean and their reaction is actually more intensified. Um, in normal conflict, there isn't really a power struggle. In a bullying situation, the person is always trying to like one up to gain power to get control of the situation, and then. You know, when, when we pull students together to kind of like work through pure conflict, there's usually everybody's remorseful. At the end, everybody wants to be friends, everybody wants to work through it, you know, everybody's owning up to things. There's a lot of, re you know, sorry and regret. Whereas in a true bullying situation, the bully, they don't care. There's no remorse, you know. It, 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 would, it takes a lot to, to, to get to that point. And then, and, and, you know, we, we problem solve with students all the time. We bring them in, let's talk about this. And we're able to problem solve. Here, usually the bully has no no indication or no, they, they're not into the problem solving. So how can you guys help? There's so many things that parents can do, you know, and I, 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 when my son would come home and he would be upset and he would be telling me about things that happened at school, you know, of course as a parent you want to jump right in and you want to solve it and you want to give all these things that you can do to, to fix the situation. And I would say, hit the pause button. The first thing that you need to do is just listen. You know, just listen. So everything that you do is going to help your, your child decide, you know, and kind of figure out how, what do I do from here? They're, they're looking to see what your reaction is going to be. So if you have a heightened reaction and you're, you instantly are like, oh my gosh, and you're, you know, getting upset and, you, you know, mama bear comes out, which, and papa bear, sorry, I'm not, I don't, you know, um, you know, they're, they're going to feed off of that, you know, so they need us to kind of step back and, 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 and go from there. So, oh, this is you. Yeah. All right, so. I guess next, kind of our next dive into this presentation is, all right, so say your child comes home, you need to decipher, is it bullying, is it pure conflict? I mean, obviously we are all knowledgeable that if it qualifies under bullying, things are intensified, right? That you need to make sure you've notified the school or you've notified the proper people to help you in that situation because there's definitely an imbalance of power and we want to make sure whoever needs it is being protected and taken care of. On the other side of it, like if you've determined that the struggle your child is having truly qualifies under peer conflict, we also need to take a breath that peer conflict is part of life, right? Even when you're my age, I tell my kids all the time, my kids, I call them, but my kids at school, like peer conflict it is just part of life. Dealing with people that are mean, who are not nice, who don't have empathy, who struggle with compassion, learning how to deal with those people, work with those people is a life skill that everyone does need to learn how. Um, because either you're going to find it in the workplace or you're going to find it in schooling when you get older, wherever that location may be, it does exist. So, you know, our next kind of step is, well, then what can you do next to truly help your child essentially figure that out on their own with your support so that when they come in in the situation that they can kind of 
figure it out in that moment to truly empower them to be a problem solver, empower them to make those decisions that are going to be best for them. So another thing we need to look at is a lot of times your kids might talk to you. This is what's going on. This is great. But does anybody here have junior high kids? Or, yeah, okay. Do they always talk to you? No? Okay, cool. Yeah. So you might not always get that. Or maybe you do or maybe you don't. Um, but let's say your kid just doesn't talk. Is more closed off. So I think it's important to kind of notice some warning signs of like, Ugh, something might be going on, but maybe I haven't caught on. Um, so if your child complains of headaches, stomach aches, feeling sick, their eating habits have changed. So eating more, eating less. Um, sleeping changes. That's a big warning sign that something is going on. Um, declining grades, loss of interest in schoolwork or not wanting to go to school, sudden loss of friends or avoidance. Feeling helplessness or decreased self-esteem um, or even self-destructive behaviors. So I guess it's just good to kind of make a mental note that if your child, even if just that day, they don't want to talk and they're more closed in, these are all signs that something is going on, right? Whether it's bullying, whether it's true just pure conflict or meanness, something is going on that we got to need, that we need to figure out. Um, also, some more signs might be fights, right? Physical or verbal fights. Um, having friends who bully others, increasingly aggressive, maybe they're getting sent to the principal's office a lot, unexplained extra money or belongings, blame others for their problems, don't accept responsibility, are competitive and worry about their reputation or popularity. Um, so as you're observing your children and watching them in social situations or even at home, right, being aware that these are all signs of something might be going on. Um, as we kind of mentioned earlier, you know, kids are not always going to tell you what's going on. Like, right? So studies even tell us that adults are notified in less than 40% of peer conflict situations, which is kind of surprising to me, but then it's kind of not. Because um, I often find a lot of times, like, when kids come to my office, mind you, as a school counselor, we're third party, right? So we are not part of your inner circle. We're not part of your home. Um, so I find a lot of students come seek my assistance pretty much because of that fact. Um, but when I make that phone call home, I have a lot of parents who say, I didn't know about that. I didn't even know that was going on. Um, and this would kind of explain it, um, just because, I mean, whether a number of reasons that the kids might not talk to you, um, whether they're humiliated or they're being bullied or they're just really having a hard time being socially isolated or feeling rejected. Um, so recognize that if your kids don't talk to you, it's okay. Okay, you're not the only one. Um, but knowing those warning signs to kind of pick up on those cues is so important. I would also say that like a lot of times when students come into my office, they'll say, well, this has been going on for a while, you know, so it's, it, it, it's taken them three times before or three, you know, issues with the same friendship group that, that then they finally want to talk about it because now they know like this has happened three times. It's a repeated pattern. So I really need some help. I tried to figure it out, my, you know, by myself this first time, you know, I, I enlisted some other friends, maybe I talked to a teacher, but now I need, I need your help. So, you know, Sometimes even with us, it takes you know three or four times before we're even in the loop and, and trying to help them problem solve. So what can you guys do? What can we do to help our students work through peer conflict? Um, if your child comes to you and you see some warning signs, what, what can we do to help? So this is where we keep in mind that we have to kind of really hit that pause button and really, really think about, you know, what's your experience been? You know, like, I hear a lot of students say, well, my mom, this happened to my mom when she was younger, and this is, what, this is what my mom says that I should do. So we have to be really, really mindful of students today are different than students were when we were younger. And we also have to make sure that we're not putting the things that happened to us onto our kids. So, and that's a hard one. It's you know? so hard. So like my four-year-old, like I watched her, like, I don't know, we went somewhere mm. to some event, and some kid like pushed her off the slide. And like I was like ready to like right dive in to like take care of the situation and like she just popped up and she went on her way. It doesn't even look like it affected her. So I decided to let it go. And then I talked to her there. She's like, yeah, I just let that kid go. He must have wanted that slide more than me. And I was like, okay. So she was like, okay. You know what I mean? So like where I would have probably made the situation worse by diving headfirst in, that was kind of a moment where like I just watched her and like physically she looked fine, her facial expressions, her body language. But it was hard. I was and like, I was sometimes we have to allow our, our children to be on, 
uncomfortable. So they're, they're having this conflict, they're, they're not getting along with somebody. It, we have to allow them to be uncomfortable because the more that we try to fix that uncomfortable feeling or, or avoid that uncomfortable feeling, then they don't learn how to like, to, how to work through that. Like, so I, I feel like a lot of times when I'm working with students, they, they are not real tolerant of feeling uncomfortable. They don't know what to do with it, so they try to avoid it. And we have to help them work through that. Um, and now we, we gotta make sure that we're, we're remembering when your child comes to you, you're only hearing their perspective of what happened. There's lots of different, you know, like there's another story, the other student's story, and then somewhere in the middle is like the, the reality of really what happened. So we gotta be really careful. So we ask you to ask these questions, you know, can you hit the pause button and maybe just listen and not say anything and just kind of like let them say what they have to say and kind of get it out and then maybe rephrase back to them and say, I hear you saying, you know, that sounds really, really upsetting or that sounds really, really complicated or I can hear how upset you are about that. And then think about, you know, is this, does, does this bring anything up for yourself, for, you know, for you and what happened in your life when you were growing up? But we gotta make sure that we're getting all the facts. So the just listening part is the hard part because we want to go straight into problem solving. You know, somebody's you know being mean to my child. Somebody's doing something that's causing my child pain. We want to go straight into like, here's what you do. The majority of the time when students end up in our office, you know, we're, we spend probably 10, 15, 20 minutes just letting them kind of talk through it. You know, and then by the time they're you know they they kind of like let it all out and kind of talk through it, you can just see a, just a change, like from the moment they walked in to, to where they are now. Sometimes they just need that release to kind of to, to just kind of get it out. Um, and we you know we re reiterate this with students all the time. It's okay to feel uncomfortable. Like yeah, that sounds like it it you know it's really really upsetting you, and I, I can tell you that you're really uncomfortable with that. Um, and and you know letting them know that we see that. Um, oh, yes, oh, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, so the just, just listen, make sure that, helping your children to like label their feelings, like that, you know, that's really upsetting, that, that was really, you know, that was complicated, that bothered you, I can tell how frustrating that is for you. Help them to own, own their feelings. <coughs> Well, and I think this is hard, right? Because, like, I get this, right? We kind of have this tendency as parents that we want to fix it. Like, I want you to feel, like, satisfied. I want you to feel good in this moment. But recognize as soon as we do that, we're also not helping our children um, figure it out for themselves or do it on their own, right? As soon as we jump in and we fix it all or we get involved when maybe they don't need us at that time, right, it's not giving them a chance to be independent. It's not giving them a chance to problem solve. So like a lot of times in this listening phase, we just listen. But even the next slide would be, you know, we gotta look at different options. We gotta talk that out instead of just jumping into like, this is what we're gonna do. Well, no, this does need to be a conversation. So as we're going through these steps, I guess that is also my encouragement is when your child comes to you with an issue, and I know we're all busy, but making sure that it is a conversation. It's a sit down conversation to go through all of these different steps to make sure that they are heard, you're getting all the facts and to kind of helping them figure out their choices to problem solve. Um, but I know, like even personally, that that trying to fix it would just be really hard. Mm -hmm. We try to fix it because so we're uncomfortable. We're uncomfortable for our child, so we want to fix it. We want to get right into there to the problem solving. So empathizing, making sure that um, students feel heard and understand, you know, that we got to try to put ourselves in the in the shoes of the other of the other person. So what do you think was going on for that other person when they were calling you those names? Why do you think that they were doing that? And then, you know, kind of rephrasing back to them, like, here's what I'm hearing you say. And then it's okay to share with your, your child, like, things that have happened to you, right? That you want to relate to them. They want to relate to you. They want to know, you know, that, that you understand where they're coming from. Um, so it's important to like kind of get them moving so that they're not just stuck in that feeling. We want the next step is we want to kind of like how how can we work through this? What's what's what can we do? So this is kind of goes into our is it bullying or is it pure conflict? This is going to help us kind of dissect that. So we're going to ask some some pretty poignant questions. We're going to try to see is there a history? So with this group of friends, is there a history of this problem happening? You know that would go into. How long has this been happening? That would go into the intentional. 
and they're repeated. Has this happened before, or is this just an isolated incident? And then the victim and the aggressor, like trying to figure out, you know, is there a victim and is there an aggressor, or are we on an equal playing field there? So we gotta be really careful not to label. So as soon as your child comes home and they're describing a situation to you, we gotta be really, really careful that we're not labeling it fully, and we're also not blaming anybody, like it was the other person's fault. Maybe it's not anybody's fault. Maybe it's a miscommunication. You know, we see that a lot, like just the interpretation of like the situation, and maybe like somebody was rolling their eyes and you know laughing, but they it, it wasn't directed towards your child at all. It's just a miscommunication. So this is where we can start to problem solve. Like, what what, what would be some some solutions? So. What, what kind of things, what could, what could we do in these situations? So that's like, that's where you can kind of help lead a little bit. Like, so what would be a, a you know, if a student came home and said that their, um, their friends aren't talking to them anymore, they wouldn't talk to them at lunch or recess. You know, we could, we went through all the steps, we got all the facts, we went sides, we heard how frustrating that is and how much they're upset about that. We could kind of help them brainstorm. So what do you think you could do? Like, could you, talk to them? Is there anything that you want to say? Like, we would kind of like help guide them on what, what are some solutions? And we're looking at, you know, making sure that there's more than one solution. Because sometimes that one, that one choice that we make, like maybe they try it and it doesn't work. So then we have to say, okay, what are we going to do next? Um, like I think a lot of times in this scenario, like, so let's think last week. Last week I had someone come to my office. Um, she was having an issue with one of her friends. Her friends keep, oh, this is silly. This is right junior high. Her friend keeps making fun of the way um, she walks. Okay, um, and so we're, uh, so in that conversation, right after she's told me that she's hurt, she's got tears in her eyes. My friend's making fun of me. I guess she's not really my friend, right? So after I've kind of gone through the, my first couple steps, my next move would be, okay, what? Where can we go from here, right? I hear you're hurt. I hear you're sad. But again, like the last slide said, I don't want you stuck in that emotion. Like at some point, we need to move past that, and we need to kind of figure out our game plan. It's kind of how I like to word it, right? So, what are our options? Option one, maybe you go talk to that student. Maybe you go talk to your friend, and you say, "Hey, why do you keep making comments about the way I walk?" Option two, we could have your student come down, and we could all think, like talk together. Option three, maybe next time your friend makes that comment. You could, you know, tell them to be quiet or don't say that or just let them know that it hurts your feelings, right? So going through all these different scenarios also empowers your children. Um, I find it also empowers, like I even watch it in their eyes when I'm giving them choices because essentially it's their peer conflict that I want them to solve, right? It's their issue. It's their struggle. So what is the best kind of decision for you? What avenue do you want to take? Um, I find a lot of times the students I work with, Actually, they're all different. It really depends on the scenario, right? I get the, Mrs. Williams, I'm gonna try, let me see if I can talk to my friend, can you follow up with me tomorrow, right? And then my response will be, okay, you give that a try tomorrow, I'm writing your name down, and we're gonna follow up, and if this doesn't work, we're gonna move to plan B, right? Or I got, um, yesterday, my student said, no, like I'm really this upset, can you just call this student down, and can we see if we can figure this out, right? So in that moment, we kind of are able to mediate together, um, and usually it's a miscommunication. It's usually like, oh, I thought we were having fun. You were laughing too. I was laughing. I thought like it wasn't a big deal. Um, I didn't know it really hurt your feelings. I'm sorry. And that's usually where it ended. Or I even have my students who are like, you know, I'm gonna let it go for now. I'm gonna take a breath, and that the next time it happens, I'm going to, you know, say something. And there's where I even love number four. Right. Right. So like when you've gone through these choices with your children, going over, okay, well, what would you say? Like when you're in that moment, and the, your friend says, hey. You walk like that. Like, what would be your response? Hey, can you not say that? That really hurt my feelings, right? And actually having your child say that back to you, right? And you kind of role playing that scenario allows them to have the words, allows them to know what to say and to practice it, right? If we even think in our own lives, like sometimes I don't know what to say when things get awkward at the dinner table, right? With my in-laws or whatever. So sometimes I might be like, okay, next time I'm in this moment. Here's what I'm going to say next, right? Can you can everybody kind of think of like even in your own personal life, like you kind of prepare yourself on how you're going to handle that conflict or that uncomfortable feeling to kind of ease that. Um, so I guess in having those conversations, reviewing all of your choices, but also having those role playing experiences, I mean, right? It gives your child to know that you can do this. Mm -hmm. I I'm confident in you. You can figure this out. And you know, if it doesn't work out, 
we also are not going to be friends with everybody, right? So I need to teach you to stand up for yourself, to say what you need to say, and then also if this doesn't work out, plan B might be creating some space, or maybe getting the school counselor involved, or getting the principals involved, right? But it's also giving them a chance to kind of take it on, um, and that is empowering, and that is like an I believe in you type action by telling them that. Sometimes when you're role playing, it's hard because the student gets stuck. Like they need you to give them the words. Like here, let's try these words. Like do those feel all right? And then let's put your own spin on the words that you want to use. Because I, I do feel like sometimes it comes down to like communicating in that moment. Like you're like kind of shell shocked when it's happening, and then you, you kind of get stuck. So they just need to like practice, practice, practice. And sometimes they just need us to give give them the words to use. Let's try these words. Let's try this. So. This one's really important. Um, I Sometimes I get students who, I have these sheets that students fill out if they need to, to see me if there's like a, you know something happening or they're having a problem or they're having a conflict with a, another student. And they'll fill out, this is an emergency. You know, and then I'll read like kind of what the problem is and then I have to work with them on like what an emergency is, what, it, what it's not. In their mind, it's a really big problem. But sometimes I have to let them just kind of sit with it for a little bit. So giving them some time to kind of cool down. Because usually when they're ending up in my office, it's heightened. They're really, really heightened. And sometimes we have to just kind of hit that pause button and we kind of like need to let them kind of sit with it and calm down before we kind of like unpack it. So this, you know, I, I've been teaching I statements and working with students about them owning their feelings all the way back to kindergarten. I think it's, it's really, really important that students learn you know, to say and own up, like, this makes me feel uncomfortable. I feel upset when you do this. Um, this really bothered me when you, it's very different than, you know, accusing somebody. You know, you did this, you did that, you did that, and that's why I feel this way. Those are accusatory words. We want, stu we want students to, to kind of come in without blaming and just use their I, their I statements. I feel upset. Well, and I find with I statements, right, when your children are able to look at somebody, or even look at you, right, like I, right, even in communication conflict between child and parent, right, by them saying, like, I'm really hurt when you're on your phone all the time, right, that immediately connects with, like, an emotion, right, so immediately I'm able to kind of help develop that empathy to how somebody else feels. So that's what I statements also do, is it truly helps the other person to develop that empathy, be like, oh my God, like, my actions are impacting somebody else, right? My actions or my words are doing something, they're giving that person emotion, I need to reevaluate. So I also like I statements, because it also creates ownership to like my feelings are mine. Um, that's how I feel and I need to own that, it empowers me, but it also lets the other person know like, hey, I'm a human too. Like, I'm a human, like this is, this is the emotion I'm having because of this, right? Mm -hmm. And then just, you know, thinking about like, if we're gonna pull, pull friends together, we want to make sure that, you know, it's not just a one-sided conversation that everybody's listening to each other. And then the hope is, is that we're going to pull everybody together and we're going to be able to work through it. You know, we're going to, everybody's going to say what their side is, what they're, you know, what they're, what they're going to own their own feelings, here's how I'm feeling, and then hopefully we can all come together and say, you know, here, here's the goal, here's what we want to do. And then we got to figure out what the plan is. What, like, you know, are we going to say something? Are we going to stick up for ourselves? Are we going to tell that person how we're feeling? Um, or are we going to do that and then nothing changed? So now we need to all come together and kind of sit down and, and talk it through. But we got to, like, we got to let our children and we got to trust our children that, you know, once we go through all these steps, that they're going to choose the right thing that's, that that feels right for them. And, you know talking to them about being flexible and trying to come up with a compromise or something that's going to be a win-win for everybody involved. So it can't just be one-sided. You know, it can't just benefit your child. You know, we got to think about, like, the perspective of everybody involved. I think the biggest one was step five is just making sure you follow up. So let's say you decided um, as a family that this is what you're going to do, this is our game plan, just making sure, okay, tomorrow we're going to follow up and we're going to see how that worked out. Because um, if it didn't work out, let's, let's try something else. I mean, maybe I do need to get involved. Maybe I don't need to get involved as a parent. Maybe we also need to chalk it up that this might just be a meanness situation, so I need you to do your best to stay away from that kid. The kid's not good for you. You know what I mean? It's not helping you feel good and empowered and strong, right? So creating that distance is also a part of life, right? Like, I don't know if any of you have this in your lives, but I do know mean people in my life, and the mean people I know, like, purposely choose to, like, politely, hi, 
right? It's like I'm still being kind, I'm still being polite, but I'm like purposely choosing to kind of just create some distance. Like I don't have to engage in conversation. Um, I find that whenever I do, it doesn't make me feel good. It doesn't make me feel empowered. empowered. So in those scenarios, like that's also what we're teaching our children as well, is that not everybody is going to get along. Not everybody is going to have empathy. Unfortunately, that is the nature of life, right? So trying to problem solve, trying to come up with different plans, but maybe your plan B or C is, we just need to create some distance between you and that child. And we just need to be able to kind of let it go one ear and out the other because that child is not part of your inner circle, right? That child is not part of your inner circle of friends or inner circle of family. Um, I know that's really hard, but that oftentimes are the conversations I also do have. Is after we tried a couple different problem solving techniques, right? Now it's about creating an environment that makes you feel good and makes you feel happy because the only person we can control is ourselves. Um, so making sure that you certainly, um, the big one would be follow up, right? Seeing how, hey, how'd that go? We talked about that you were gonna you know, talk to your friend about that, or how'd today go? Did so and so kind of, were you able to create some distance or did it not really work, right? Because then it also helps you as a parent know what you need to do um, for, next steps. for next steps. We know you want to advocate for your babies too. Like, I, I get that, absolutely. Um, but kind of giving them that first chance to do so um, does help them feel like they're in control, right? And, Kind of what we all seek for. Yep. Um, so just some helpful tips. We've probably already gone over this, right? So bottom line is you want to help your child understand the difference between typical peer meanness and bullying. There is a difference, right? So again, when you go back to that um, bullying piece, think of the triangle, right? Bullying has to be targeted, has to be repeated, and there has to be a power balance. If it's not all three things, it's not bullying. Um, I would think bullying is definitely more severe, right? As soon as we hear the word bullying, if you identify all three areas of that triangle, well, I'd be notifying somebody to get some assistance, or I would be stepping in as an adult. Um, again, but I can definitely say 80% of the situations I observe, I witness, I hear, 80% are just pure conflict meanness. Um, and so in those situations, making sure that we aren't labeling it bullying, that we're keeping it as like problem-solving techniques to help your children feel like they can handle it. Um, making sure you keep the lines of communication open, which I know are always fun, especially if you got teenagers. They tend to kind of want to just be in their phones or stay off in the rooms. Um, but even, you know, really doing your best to have those conversations and making sure we're open about what's going on. Um, another thing that always helps, this is just good mental health practice, right? Encourage your kids to do what they love. Keep them involved. Keep them busy. Keep them happy. Um, do your best to keep them surrounded with positive people and people and kids that you know treat your babies right and help them and encourage them and motivate them. Um, but recognize that even the bestest friends, they're going to potentially have a conflict at some point, right? And helping them manage that and work through that um, to where there is a win-win and we can all kind of leave happy and content. Um, but also, and I know this is hard, um, but even model how to treat others with kindness and respect. Um, so I'm sure you've noticed I bring up like our scenarios as adults um, because I do feel like we as adults we model how we treat people and how to solve peer conflict and how when I'm sitting at the dinner table with my in-laws and things like hmm she looks like that right like <laughs> but my children are watching me right they're watching how I respond they're watching how I react um, and they are learning from that even yeah. unfortunately our worst and our best whatevers um, so being aware of that. It helps us just be cognizant of when we're having these conversations um, with our children that they are us, right? And they also learn from us. So if we can be aware of how we handle peer conflict with ourselves, it can certainly help how we help them do the same. That one's really, really important. I, I have a, a, I call him an adult now because he's in college, even though he's not an adult. He's still my baby. Uh, but he's always watching how I'm solving, you know, like how I deal with like stressors, you know? and. He, he's constantly like looking at like well I, I remember when you did this and you handled this you know you you kind of yelled at that person I he's right like he's seeing me not handle things well so like I have been really diligent now especially and when he was in high school to say like I didn't handle that really well so like and, and self-reflecting that like yeah I needed to go and have a conversation with that person because I didn't I didn't do so hot and like for him to see that I'm owning up that like I didn't handle that real well and I had to make amends with this person. That's a really important thing to like teach your, you know, for your child to see with you that you are able to admit, yeah, I didn't handle that well. Or even with, with them, like if you blow your top, which we all do, we're parents sometimes, like you admit like, hey, like 
you know, after I had my little time out and I was able to compose myself, you come back and you have a conversation with your child about it, so. All right, activity time. <laughs> All right, so we are gonna pass out scenarios, essentially read the scenario, and then we're just gonna go over it together, we're gonna actually call you out, but we're gonna have fun, because it sounds like a lot of fun, right? Okay. okay, but we are interested to see, like, how would you handle this? What would be your you response? Same one. <laughs> All right. So let's look at scenario one. Who had scenario one? Hey, girls. Okay, so a scenario one is someone is calling my child mean names. So what would be your parent response and your action plan? Does anybody mind sharing? Like, what would you say? Is it mean? Is it just mean? Or is it bullying? What do you think? We assume it's mean. Okay. We need more information. Right. It's happening often. Right. We can feel. And then there's another one. That one. Hurt. Power struggle. Right. Right. But. Assuming it's me, just being me. Right. Um, and also, is it someone their friend, or is it someone that they don't really have a relationship with and they don't dislike or wouldn't want to hear the other? Um, or do you need them to dialogue with this friend? And, yes. And help them talk through their options and. Yep. Yeah. Yep. All of that is like you need more facts. You need to gather the facts. Like even even if you think it's just you know the the conflict between the two friends or a group of friends, you still need to gather all the facts. Like what's their perspective? What's the other person person's perspective? And then we need to kind of figure that out. So like, are we just going to kind of take a time out? Like we need a break from each other. We're going to let you know let them know this is making me feel upset. I feel upset. This hurts my feelings. And then if there, it still keeps happening, then we're in a different situation, then we need to bring everybody together and probably talk through it. So, good job. Yeah. Two. I would agree. On the bus and at recess, my child has been pushed, shoved by another student. Good, too. Anybody? You, too. Okay. So, I think I had both these scenarios on the same child. Oh, okay. <laughs> my first thought was, I'm going to get on the bus and I'm going to talk to that kid and I'm telling <laughs> Look crooked at my daughter. Of course, you can't do that. I'll get arrested. I like how your shirt says "Mama Bear." Just a thought in my head. Yes. And usually, I'll be driving home the bus stop, or you know, I'll say, "Well, what happened? Did you say anything for this to happen? Did you do anything earlier in the day? Um, you know, what else happened? You know." Um, Get the whole Trying story. to see if there's a history or if it's yeah. an isolated incident. Yeah. Okay. Has this been going on? Have they done this before? Um, a lot of times I'll say, suggest to my daughter that, you know, you could mention to this kid if this keeps going, you can just mention that his mom and your mom are friends. You know, just suggest that, you know, that we know each other. Mm -hmm. And so his actions will have consequences at home. Not saying, well, my mom's going to call your mom, but just say, hey, do you know that my mom and your mom are friends? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and kind of connect, make a connection. Mm -hmm. like, and, I don't know. I like that what you're saying, because a lot of times when students feel connected to each other, it, and it is an isolated incident, it's not going to happen again when there's a connection there. Yeah. Whether it be your mm -hmm. own connection or a parent connection. I often like even a response would be, well, what that look like? It's a lot of times the conversation I have, right? Because like a this mm -hmm. looks very different than a, mm -hmm. right? But yeah. to sometimes like a fifth grader, they're like, I got shoved. I'm like, oh my gosh, like what that look like? And they're like, well, the kid was walking, and then another kid shoved him, so he shoved me. Very different scenario, right? Than a two-handed face-to-face shove. So that's often an also response that I might give is, well, what does that look like when you're trying to gather? Like, show, show me. Like, yeah. I, I do a lot of show me. show me. Show me what that looks like or how that was. What did you think? Same or a little different? Um, similar. I mean, I, the first thing I'd ask my son who has a very hard time understanding sometimes events, okay. perspective is like, okay, it was just one of your friends. Right. It was just somebody that you know right. or talk to. And then just did it happen? more than once, because um, he has a friend that I think they kind of play shove each other. Mm -hmm. And then the one time he got shoved, he fell down. So I'm like, well, that doesn't mean they're doing it. You shove this person right. too. Um, right. I would have labeled it mean, okay. um, unless it, unless my son was saying that it was like happening more than once. Okay. Which I love that you brought that point, because I, I observe that a lot where it's even, I mean, it's all junior high. Whether it's verbal or physical, right? I notice all my kids, they're joking. And they're having fun, they're messing around with each other, and then someone like takes it too far. Mm -hmm. 
And then we're no longer joking, and then someone's in tears or someone's seriously offended, but like it's really hard, and it is hard, to find that line of, okay, where, was, where did we where cross the line? Right. Because, you know what I mean, about two minutes earlier, you guys were both joking around, messing around, content with whatever was being done, to the point where then something happened and someone was no longer happy with it. Um, which is a very hard thing to try to figure out, right? Um, but trying to, I find that that happens a lot. I mean, do you kind of witness that a lot, especially with just middle school, it's junior high, young around, around, around and silly and goofy, and you know, they're you know, they're just handsy. Like they're just <laughs> real handsy. It's the only word I mean. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good definition. Yeah. It is. Yeah. So. All right, number three. A bunch of students are spreading rumors about my child. Who had who had three? Three? Just me. Oh. <laughs> Um, I don't. This one's a tough one for me. I would. I would say it could be both. Okay. Um, I mean, I know that kids are going to be kids, and that they can be mean. But if it's a bunch of students doing it, that to me is repetitive, and there would be a power imbalance mm -hmm. there. Right. Mm -hmm. So then I would feel that yes, it would be bullying. The majority of this, of this that comes to my office is. A student made up a lie about me and said blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, well, is the lie true? Because it, it's if it's a lie, then it's not true, right? So we kind of have to like kind of talk about that. Like rumors are, are not true, right? And, and the group that you surround yourself with, do they believe it? No, they don't believe it. Okay. So who, who, do, who, do you, who are you worried about, you know, is believing it? And like, how is it keeping going? You know, I, we kind of like, talk about all of those situations. But if it's a group of students and what versus one, I guess right. I see where you're going with that. That's mm -hmm. a power imbalance. So what would you suggest to your child? I don't know. I mean <laughs> with this one a lot of times honestly like we just tell her, hey, suck it up. How old is she? She is seven. She'll be eight in June. First grade. Second. Second grade. Okay. Yep. Okay. Sometimes, you know, we just, you know, we just let her know. Hey, yeah. you gotta suck it up. If it's not true, don't Great. worry about not it. True. Brush Great. it off. Be better. Um, you know. A lot I love. Of times, so you're like building resiliency. Like, and I think that that's something that that we really have to work on with our with our children and our students. It's it's building that resiliency. There's there's you know things that happen and yeah they hurt our feelings and they make us sad and they they bother us but. This is something we can bounce back from. Right, you, you know, rise above it and be yeah. better. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I guess mom and dad are kind of, <laughs> kind of tough and say, hey, you just gotta suck it up and move on and ignore them. And you know, she came home last week, and I will, I will say that this one here, she can be the feisty one. <laughs> she can be. I don't want to say she can be mean, um, but she is very competitive. She always has to be first. She. Um, gymnastics a couple weeks ago she did something and she goes now let's see who can beat me <laughs> mm -hmm. I like that confidence. yeah so she's very she's very confident and she always has to be first and she's very competitive so if somebody's spreading rumors about her she's not gonna care she may not but she had um, a little spat with friends which one of her friends it's like one of her best friends they go back to preschool um, one day they're best friends, one day they're bickering back and forth. And she came home and she said, I had a bad day, and we talked about it, and even Dad was there. Um, and Dad pretty much said, okay, he's like, you got to call him out. He says, go back to school tomorrow, find out, hey, did I do something wrong? Are you mad at me? Did I do something? You know, and she did. She went back to school the next day, and she talked to her friends, and hashed it out. I always like lead with students when, when they are having those conversations like you're really confused because they're not really talking so you're confused by that. You yeah know, they, they didn't want to play like, with her yeah you know or they didn't want to work on a project together with her mm -hmm. you know we said well why you know did you say something mean did you were you being bossy because that's another thing um, with her being the, that leader role she tends to be bossy um, so we just said hey you know you but I like them about that it. having those following up conversations. Like it's amazing how many times when I'm talking to a student, they're having an issue with somebody else. I was like, well, what did you say back? I go, well, part of this is also you learning how to stick up for yourself too, and it's not easy, right? So part of us is saying like, when you hurt a rumor or someone isn't talking to you, you ask, hey, 
why aren't you talking to me? What's going on? Or don't say that about me. That's not true. Please stop. Right? And like I even scenario with kids like looking at other students like stop saying that right now. Like I kind of want you to say it in that tone and say it sternly because say it like this you mean is, it. exactly because this is part of also sticking up for yourself when someone does cross the line or someone is not being nice. Because right, even though we might say it's kids being kids, which I don't prefer that saying because it doesn't make it okay. Right? I, I find that even if you know kids are being mean, it still is not okay. So I like to look at this angle as it's right, it's teaching our children how, how to deal with it when it does happen. Um, because it is a part of life, but it still doesn't make it okay. So I, I, I agree with you. I like that your response is, you know what I mean? Well, what could you say back when this happens next? So that you are advocating for yourself. You are sticking up for yourself and you're having that conversation. We, um, we use the words a lot of assertive versus bossy. Don't be bossy when you're saying something. Be assertive when you're saying something. See, and that's just it, too. With, like, I know my kid, and I'm like, well, did you say something? You know, there was, she does, um, she's a competitive roller skater. And Saturday, we were at the rink, and another mom came up to me and said, uh, your kid's being, you know, or she actually said bullying. She says, your, your kid's bullying my kid. And I said, well, wait, what happened, mm -hmm. you know? And our friend that she was with is the owner's grandson. So he knows not to act out. And she said, well, uh, you know, <coughs> they can skate better than my kid and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, they tend to play a lot. Like I saw them all out in the middle. They were playing tag, they were having fun, whatever. And, um, you know, and I asked the kids, and they said, no, we just asked her if she wanted to race with us. Yeah. You know, so even mom tried to like, call me out. I'm like, well, wait, what happened? Like, I wasn't there. I didn't hear anything. Like, Well, and that's a good example, too, that unfortunately we, we are mama bear. But I, I do notice sometimes, even with myself, like sometimes I make it worse. I didn't, I didn't help the peer conflict. I didn't help my child figure it out and be empowered. Like, I kind of, you know what I mean, added more stuff to the situation. And I even notice that sometimes, and I know we got mama bears, but some peer conflicts I witness in my in my in the school I work for. But I watch it, and I'm like, we could have solved this in two seconds. If you know what I mean, we would have just kind of done this together. But then we got mama bears calling us, and sometimes then it just like we added like ten more things on it when it was really the original conflict was probably not in the number nine of a response. Does that make sense? So it's probably like a two. We we could have figured it out absolutely and left win win. Um, so. You know, but it, unfortunately, you're just gonna just like you said. What, what's the facts? Or what's more information? So I can truly get a better understanding of what happened. Right. And right. Other mom just wasn't having it. So then, of yeah. course, it was just uncomfortable from there on out. Because it's like, oh, you know, this is what our kids do every week. They meet yeah. up with other kids and they try to play and race and play tag and whatever. And well, and, right, and there's pure conflict at our age, play. right? And yeah. it happens. So like, you know, I think in that moment, taking a deep breath and trying to just like. Unfortunately, you're not going to always get people to view, do you know what I mean, the situation as how we're viewing it, um, which is hard, but right? So trying to model it for your baby and making sure that you're creating an environment that's safe and everyone's happy and doing the best they can. Um, but I, I know that's awkward and uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but as long as you feel like you're being, you know what I mean, fair and listening and understanding, right, that's all we can do as, as parents is just to do that best we can. All right, number four, my child keeps getting text messages that are degrading and or mean. And so this does happen a lot at the junior high. Um, and what's hard about it is, like as a school counselor, a lot of it's outside of school. But as soon as it's brought into school, we can usually help navigate what to do from here. But a lot of it is outside of school, but I know this is really relevant. Um, so who had number four? Like, what would, what would you do? <laughs> This is hard because that Snapchat thing is um, <laughs> awful. It's awful. Mm -hmm. It's awful. Um, I don't know. I just um, you gotta look past them. Some people don't know. They don't say the right things. I'm, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not very good at using my words. I'm like, do it back. <laughs> <laughs> I hate to say it, but she knows me. And I'm not. You know, I'll be like, uh, I don't. But I don't, but that's what I want to say, you know, yes. like, like, you know, you know but I, uh, sometimes I'm like, then get rid of the phone, like, turn the phone off, get rid of it, give, give me the phone. The other conversations we have a lot, like, so we, if you know that you, that your child already has a problem with this person, and now these messages are going back and forth, 
you know, the first step would be like, let's try to figure out, let's unpack and figure out like, what's the history here? Why, why do we have so many issues? Where did it start? So you're looking at like, what's the history? Trying to get more facts about that. But then once you know the history and there is a history and now we're getting these messages. So why are we continually, why are we continuing to have that person on our phone? Why are we continuing to have that person as our, one of our contacts? And why are we engaging in the back and forth? You know, so there's things that you can empower your child to do to kind of shut that communication down. So, what, what, what would you guys label it? Bullying or meanness? Meanness. It depends if it keeps going on. Yeah. This one is, this one is like one of those that, yeah. it, and so I've seen it go both ways, right? right? It's continually happening, the other kid is not responding, right? I've seen, I've seen plenty of screenshots where like, I'm like, look, I didn't say anything back. And I've gotten just four messages yeah. in the last week and like right my heart hurts. Like, but in that moment, right? So like, yes, this is not okay. You know what I mean? We have to figure this out. Um, so, you know what I mean? Let me take a screenshot of it. I'm gonna help you handle it. Like this is what I would do even as a parent. Let me take a screenshot of my phone. Let me handle it. I need you to delete it. I need you to delete that number. I need you to not be associated with them anymore and I will handle it. So if you do label this as bullying, there's where, like, my recommendation is, is delete that off your phone. Like, I had a girl last week, she was sobbing. It was an awful many messages. Like, let me take it, I will handle it, I will figure this out, but I need you to delete it because we need to move on. Because back to that, like, unfortunately, some people are not going to get it. Does it make it okay? Does it make it acceptable? Absolutely not. Um, but engaging in the back and forth never works. I don't know about you guys, I have yet to see a conflict truly be resolved through text message. Usually text message just makes it 10 times worse. Mm -hmm. Or Snapchat. Um, and unfortunately, no, that's like the ongoing, that's the ongoing like go-to. Like I have two girls come to my office and they'll be like, we had an issue yesterday and then we texted all night about it. Texted all night about it? Like right, all night about it and it's still going on, right? So like, I, I highly encourage cutting off the phone at some point, being done with it at some point. I, I watch our, our babies at school, they drama all day, and then they drama all night, and they almost don't get a break from it. And then we wonder, like, how is that affecting them, right? Social, emotionally, mentally, and that concerns me, right? Because you don't even get a break. Um, like 10 years ago, um, man, 15 years ago, when I was in school, <laughs> yikes. Um, right, but like, I at least got a break. Like, I at least, like, if there was an issue during the day, like, I'd go home and I'd be with my family and I didn't even think about it because I was, like, moving on with my family activities. And unfortunately, that just doesn't happen when we get to the junior high, high school age. Um, so this is a hard one because it does go back and forth where it could absolutely be meanness. I've seen it go back and forth in a text message, right? And choosing not to be a part of those conversations, right. choosing not to go back and forth, recognizing that as a friend and be like, hey, can we talk tomorrow? Or can we talk on the phone? to try to figure this out, right? Because recognizing that text does not have volume, does not have, you can't get judged for empathy or pitch or tone when someone says something. Like usually I read these, I'm like, is that person yelling the whole time? Right. Or like, what are they doing, right? So it's hard to really gauge where those words are coming from. Um, now, if you do get, if you witness something that's happening over and over, or actually it's very mean and your child hasn't responded, Take it off their shoulders, right? That's when you say, let me take it, I need you to delete it, we're not even thinking about it, and I will take care of it, this person is not part of your circle. So we need to like not let those words be a part of us because they don't even know you, right? Having those empowering conversations. Um, but definitely could go back and forth depending on your action plan and right. the information you gain. But I do encourage, especially with the phones and the text messages, you gotta cut it off. Like there's just gotta be a point where like, we're not on our phone, we don't need it, we just need a break. We just, need, we just need a break in the evening um, just to kind of calm our minds down. All right, last one. On the bus and at the lunch table, another student is cursing and swearing at my child. Who had five? We had five. What? Oh, 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 so many five. All right, what, what would, I don't know, what would your parent response be? Well, it says and, so it's right. like a multiple situations, like it's happening more than once a day. That way. Yeah. Well, we had a question about that because is it on multiple days or is this on one day? Just one day twice? So yeah, right, right. Yeah, yeah. So let's say it's one day, two, two, two on the bus and at the lunch table. Same kid. Same kid. Well, it's, it's probably mean it's just going from morning to afternoon. But um, see, I, I have two kids and I, they're polar opposites. One would 
mystic social cues all together or get really angry. And I have another one that has thinnest skin on earth and would throw in a ball and cry. So it's kind of like, which kid am I going to If it's the thin skin one, I would probably say, you know, we'd have to have a long talk about, you know, you have to learn, to, well, A, why? Why is this kid person yelling at you? You know, but did, did you do something basically? Or is it just the kid that you wear it means? In which case, you have to say, you have to learn to ignore or go to an adult. Mm -hmm. Or even this one, I find a lot of like students think like they're cursing, and like the kids are just cursing, right? So I find this huge. There's this huge line, especially at the junior high, when you see it. Like I have this one group of kids that don't curse, don't say any bad words. Like they are, they're like they're on it. Then I have this group of like this other half, right? That they're just like, yeah, I use this word, I use that word. I'm like. The more they can get into one sentence, right? The better. Right, right. So, like, right. So, like, I just, I just had a conversation with one of my tables at the lunch, and it's like a conversation. But like, I got three boys who are offended, three boys who are cursing. But you can see how I can see how each could be misconstrued to this, right? Like, but they're not really cursing at them. They're just like cursing, and it's offending them, right? So, gaining that knowledge. How? What does it look like? How is it actually happening? What happens before? What happens after? Um, is it? We always say like, so do they say your name? Like Jacob, and then say the curse word, or you know whatever. Like, trying to just gather those facts because that tells you that it's intentional and it's directed at you. Or are they just at the lunch table on the bus? I, I feel like at Nord, it's on the bus more than at the lunch table. Um, they're you know this is just their cool conversation, and so they think they're cool, but it's not directed at them. But it feels that way. So it kind of gets lost in translation. Mm -hmm. Or I got, I had another video, he was doing rap songs. But like in class, and he was like, I had girls come up to me and they're like, this is Williams, like he's saying these words to us. And he's like, yeah, I kind of was just joking and singing a song. And I was like, okay. And there was our conversation, like this is your morning. Right, you, you maybe, it sounded like you don't know how you're affecting other people. This is impacting your classmates. And that is not okay, right? Being aware of how we affect other people and how we can hurt other people is so important, right? It's so important in how we communicate, how we get along with others. So that was it. I mean, that was a conversation, and then it stopped from there. So like sometimes these things might just be those types of conversations, which maybe it is asking for help, getting the school involved, contacting the school counselor. I mean, I, I probably gave ten warnings out today, and it won't happen again. They just kind of sometimes I've noticed students and children just need like the hey, cross the line, you're hurting somebody, this is my friendly warning, I care about you, I need you to be successful, like this has to change. What you're doing is affecting And I'd say nine out of ten, it does stop. I mean, absolutely. We don't need to go to New Hawk or do the principal thing. Um, so maybe that's your response. Anybody else for five that had any other thoughts about it? I just want to mention that, especially in junior high, maybe also fifth grade and sixth and seven, you know, the, some kids are moving along, you know, developing faster than others, and more emotionally and mentally mature, while others, such as my own daughter, is kind of bicycling on the road when her breaks in, and much more socially mature, and so, and some kids are more street smart, than others that live in a bubble, or maybe, you know, some kids, and I don't know, judge like if they go to church or not, some kids never go to church, don't even know what it is, others go to church and would never say a bad word. Mm -hmm. So there's that, um, you know, the, the differences between them where they think it's a normal part of the language, and sometimes the foul language and the, the X-rated with the language that so sometimes they're in the classroom is like, and my daughter is like, I can't believe the stuff they're saying, and she's so offended by it. Mm -hmm. That would be my fifth grader as well. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. that these other kids are interested, they're wearing makeup, they're social media, they're interested in boys, but my daughter's still playing with her Barbie. So there is that, oh, it's just cute. There's, there's you know, you know <laughs> no, when they talk about child development and maturity, it's such a range, you know, when and, and how kids develop and when they, you know, and I have to continually remind my older two that, about my fifth grader because he's just not into the same things they were when they were in fifth grade. Like he's just <coughs> kind of walking his own path. And and that's what my daughter mm -hmm. wants mm -hmm. to be in one girl. Absolutely. Absolutely. When I have after the culture shock is worn off for me. 
I am realizing that these kids are not being deliberately mean to my daughter. Mm -hmm. She's just more socially immature. Mm -hmm. And we have to take responsibility in our daughter's social immature where she is and maybe, you know, bring her up to speed. Support her like, and grow her from role play, where she's at. You know, social interaction, give her tools in her bag that she can sometimes not always react to everything, mm -hmm. but even my older daughter who's in high school said, you just got to grow a little thicker skin. He's like, pretend you're a duck and it just rolls off your back. Oh. And so, of course, it's not happening. But it is a tricky. Oh. <laughs> it is it's tricky. so tricky and it's tricky. tough. You know, I guess when I'm working with students, right, we work with them all, but my constant conversation is it's truly about acceptance and being respectful to all students and knowing how we affect other people. Right, so and even if you're here and you're here, well, you still need to be aware that, A, cussing's not okay in school. It's not, like cussing. it's not okay in general, but like, you see me cussing at my workplace? Like, right, so it's like knowing like, it's <coughs> not the place that it's acceptable to be doing those things. And you do need to know that you're making people feel uncomfortable, and that's not okay, right? So it goes back to truly knowing how we affect other people, um, which is hard. And it's actually, it's very difficult, especially for children to know how they impact others, so that is a constant conversation. Um, but I commend you on having those talks with your girl and just trying to, right, how can we build this toolkit? How can we role play this scenario that when this happens, what could you say next? So that you kind of are more equipped to know what to happen next. Um, and, and it's okay. I don't know. In my opinion, when I look at wherever you are, no, no right or wrong, right? Right? At this point, we kind of need to work with what we got, right? And support everyone in whatever path or direction they're heading. But just making sure everyone can't feels be. accepted, important, right. and um, cared about, right? That's the ultimate goal. So we need to be respectful of how we impact others. And we can't like shift it one way or the other, like avoid all situations because we're trying to, you know, shelter our, our, our children from those other students who are like, don't do what we think is morally or ethically right. So we can't shelter them and, and swing all the way over to this side. And we can't go over here and think that everything's okay. We have to kind of like just gently, gradually expose them to these teaching moments. You know, when you hear that, when you see that, when you're at Target or you see kids doing things or, or saying things, you know, having conversations about that. Like just gently, gradually exposing them to those teaching And maybe moments. you do it as it comes up, right? right? As they come home, they're like, this right. happened. They're like, okay, let's talk about it. Right. Like it, it's already here, right? So like now this is our conversation moving forward, right? Anybody else for five? Any other thoughts? I was thinking of the kids who were using the bad language. We <laughs> need to learn. We need to learn that there are situations and you know there's places where that is totally inappropriate. Mm -hmm. yes. Like at school. Mm -hmm. And you know, whenever they're like after school in the month their own crowd, you know, that may be the acceptable language. Mm -hmm. And I'm raising boys I told mm -hmm. from that. <laughs> <laughs> You know, that it's not always appropriate to just spit it out, you know. And sometimes I thought, if I hear that F word one more time, <laughs> I, I, I say it all. I'm going to go to jail for murder. <laughs> <laughs> I say it all the time when I teach my lesson to, to the whole group. If you wouldn't say it if I was standing behind you, if you wouldn't say it in church, you shouldn't be saying it in school, you know. So you respect me enough to not say those things in front of, in my presence while I'm standing next to you, and I know you wouldn't say them in church. So don't, don't. That language needs to not not be in the school. But then when I find like when we're talking about peer conflict, I, I just think those conversations have to be had, right? So like when I have a kid come up to me, like, Williams, this kid said this to me. I mean, my next talk is, well, like let me talk to them. Maybe it's possible mm -hmm. they don't know they're crossing the line. Maybe no one's called them out in a kind of respectful mm -hmm. way, right? Nobody's called them out to say, hey, look, that's not okay. So I like to think that we just need to have that conversation. We need to know that you're, you're crossing the, the boundaries here. You're, you know what I mean? It's not a good path. And majority of the time, it, it, it does change. So, I mean, in this pure conflict adventure, know that that's why counselors are here talking. Um, that's why school counselors are here. We're here to assist you in this whole adventure. Um, so, I mean, at any point in time, I always encourage you to contact your school counselor if it's something that's happening in school. Because um, it is something, I mean, obviously, at, at hearing us, you know, we talk, we just, work through a lot. We deal with a lot of these struggles. It's part of our every day. Um, and the majority of them, we end with win-win solutions and we figure them out. And then if not, 
you know, we go to the next step to, you know what I mean, getting administration involved, maybe looking at some discipline if it goes to a bullying type situation. Um, but again, feel free to reach out so that we can have those types of conversations that, look, you can't be saying that word in school. Like, it's not appropriate, it's not acceptable, and you're offending people. Um, but yes, okay. Questions? Any questions about the scenarios? Or just in general? Or in general? We do have these lovely handouts that you can hang on your refrigerator that just kind of like goes over the steps. And then like maybe some things that you guys could say, like when somebody comes home and they want to talk to you, you know, you it just kind of goes over the steps. feel free to take a few more if you want. I made 100 million copies. Okay, you want another one? You want another one? Yeah, if you want this near your Yeah, sure. Oh, good. Did you have a conversation? Sure. But absolutely, and I, I, I we kind of just made up the handout. So feel free to take a hand. I did have kids cut them out. If you can tell, I had students cut them out. So just work with it. Okay? Work with it. I always got kids looking for jobs and study halls. I give them jobs. I have a I love that. When you give them lines. There you go. And I give lines to my little kids. Like they cut perfectly on the line. By the time they eat the balls, they don't care. They don't care. Hey, I like that they were willing. I'll take that And they were going with it. I gave them But I did really like on the handout, on the one side, I thought it was helpful like to actually give you the words to say. So sometimes as a parent, like I even stop with like, like if I didn't go to school to be a school counselor, like I probably wouldn't know what to say in some scenarios. So I thought, you know, Deb and I decided it would be really helpful to actually give you the words that <laughs> when this is brought to your attention, what you could say back. Uh, all right, any questions before we conclude? Thank you all for Thank coming. You for Aren't they dynamite? So we've got two more events this year. Uh, we've got one coming up on April 15th which is actually going to be over at Powers. What we're doing is we are pulling together a summer activity vendor fair. Where we're pulling um, the Boys, Boys and Girl Scouts are coming, T3 okay. from Avon's yep. coming, we're reaching out to the public library, the Metro Parks, all sorts of things and activities that um, it's going to be set up like science fair style. At least it is in my head right now. Hopefully it all plays out this way. Um, so that's going to be April 15th. It should be pretty great. And then our last parent event night that here will be on May 4th. And that's going to be about creating balance with technology. You know, how are, how are our, how are we modeling the things we want our kids to see? How do we set boundaries for our kids? I know I'm guilty of not being the best in that and enforcing them at home. And also what impact does that technology have on, on us as humans? So that's May 4th and then April 15th. So thank you guys for being here and see you soon. Yeah. I just love that age.